Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Really excited to still be on site in New York City, New York. We are now gonna be talking about all things related to comedy, all things related to working your ass off, 600 plus shows a year. Um, I'm I am tired. <laughs> I'm so tired as I drink my coffee. Mm. We're super excited to have Harrison Greenbaum joining us on the show. Thank you so much Thank for Thank you, us. I'm excited. Really pumped, really yeah. pumped. Um, so let's give a quick background on Harrison. Harrison's got multi-award winning comedian over the last 13 years. Um, he had a huge magic inspiration growing up as well. He's done America's Got Talent. He's done Cohen and he's done Last Comic Standing. Been eliminated from a lot of reality shows. <laughs> getting very good at it. But also that's <laughs> a, it really crucial to persevere and get up to those rankings as well and test yourself. Um, he's also the host of What's Your Problem, which is a very funny show. We're going to be talking Thank about you, that yeah. in a little bit as well. And yes, he does over 600 shows a year, which it makes him one of the most in-demand comedians in New York City. It's Thank you. Yeah, I'm super It's weird excited. to be, and this is like we're in a Shackleton-themed bar, <laughs> and so like that guy, what, survived the Antarctic? Like, or an Antarctica, right? He survived it for like seven months and like he didn't lose a man and I'm like oh I did 600 comedy like it pales in comparison to Shackleton I feel like I feel like his influence is uh but it's cold so it's keeping me awake so it's perfect yeah yeah and um so here, here's a couple things that I think are really important for Harrison to touch on um Harrison's got you know now that he has these tons of years of experience and tons of shows under his belt um I really want us to first take like a big history look at civilization okay Humans find themselves as stewards of Earth now. Yeah. Here we are. This is are. a big transition. You're yeah. like, here's your background as a comedian. <laughs> now tell me everything about the history of civilization. Well, I don't know if I'm I'll qualified. make it easier. I'll make it easier. So we have this big history look at civilization, and here we find ourselves as stewards now. We live in a very complex world, 7.7 .7 billion people now. A lot. We hockey sticked up in population. We got exponential technologies. Yeah. Well, yeah. So tell us about your thoughts on the current state of things. I mean, I think it's hard for me to take any kind of bird's eye view because I've I, the slice of, of civilization that I've experienced is, even if you include the experience that I've, I've learned through my grandparents or whatever, it's so small overall. Um, I do think there is that exponential growth. Like, that's what you look for with technology. And there, at some point, there's, there's an inflection point where it goes, like, straight vertical, right? Or almost vertical. And I, thi I, I, would li I think we're probably, if I had to guess, like, going around the inflection point like we're, we're gonna hit that straight vertical or that near vertical yep. um if it went straight up there'd be no change in value um the time would stop um but if it was so yeah. that's that's a crazy thing to think that we might have made it like yeah. no other group or or era or generation has gotten that i i, I guess the, the just to be able to experience that part where the growth is that quick um who knows maybe we didn't maybe this is just it we were just coming around the bend but yeah, I think the, the development of technology, it seems interesting. It feels to me, because I'm a big tech geek, and I, all I do is like read tech blogs and look at what's the latest gadget, and be like, what's happening at CES? You know, that kind of stuff. And it seems that we're at a point now where it's not like you dream it and then you have to come up with the technology. It's that there's so much technology available. It's just about finding a company who's willing to like put it together in the package that it needs. Like, you can make a smart refrigerator if you want. The technology definitely exists. And that's just a question of whether a refrigerator company wants to use the technology that's already there. So it's kind of interesting that you can kind of, the, the technology is almost ahead of the dreams at this point. Like you can dream a thing and be like, oh, I have all the technology to do that. Not to say that we're not gonna push it even further, but it seems really cool that like, especially all the things that I saw as a kid in sci-fi movies. Yeah. Like, is, I remember watching Big. That was a big moment for me where I realized tech was really accelerating. Was I was a kid, I was watching Big and he had a living comic book and then the iPad came out. Yeah. And I was like, I think I just got the thing that Tom Hanks has. Like, I think I now own the thing that I wanted as a boy. Yeah, yeah. And it's here, and it does more than just being a comic book. Like this is, yeah. that's just one of the things this thing does. So I think, yeah, we're at the point now where it's, it really is like our dreams are almost falling behind the pace of technology because technology is accelerating so fast. And hopefully we'll have that next moment where we're like, we're excited for flying cars and then in a couple decades it's like boom like the normal the normality is flying cars or that the we're excited for preventative medicine so we don't have to be alzheimer's and cancer and all this kind of stuff oh that medically that i mean that's the ray kurzweil thing of like reaching that point yeah. where 
we're either the last generation to die or we're the first generation not to. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. It'll be really suck if we're the last generation to, to, to die. die. Yeah, yeah. And there's our kids who are like, we're gonna live forever. forever. Like, God damn it. <laughs> or if we're the first we're the first generation to not die, but we haven't gotten any of the anti-aging. So we're the only old people on earth yeah. forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah forever. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna be like 90 years old and everybody else is gonna be gorgeous. <laughs> and then you just have to hope we become some kind of fetish that people are like, oh, I'm really oh, into the those, old people. those wrinkly yeah. people. They're so rare. That would really, that would be the worst case scenario. I would love to live forever, I guess, as long as I could be like, as long as there's no like, oh, Henry twist to living forever. But man, if I get to live forever, but the, I have to be in a 90 year old body when everybody else is in a 20 year old body, that does not seem, that does not seem fun or fair. Harrison, I think a good question to follow up with you on this would be, what are some of the, you, you, you indicated that the hockey stick and we're riding along and we're at that inflection point. Now, what would you say are some of these pressing issues that we need to, as a unity, as a civilization, make sure that we have ironed out well? I mean, I, I'm no expert. I'm literally a stand-up comedian. Um, but I, I do think that one of the dangers of any time you accelerate through something like with any process, is that there is a sort of, there's a processing speed that happens within within each of us of how fast we can process information and develop things. Yes. And then as you add more and more people, because uh, I was a psych major in college, and we yes. studied intergroup dynamics. Um, yes. The more people you add, the slower the overall processing time is. Like we, I was in a, a class, it was actually uh, also part of the Harvard Business School. And we were talking about, you know, like how, do, how many people should be in your organization? How do you organize your organization? And you, find, you know, there are some orchestras that don't have a conductor. There's this one orchestra called Orpheus. They don't have a conductor. Everything is done dem de democratically. And it's cool and it works, but it takes them a lot longer to make a decision because there's not one conductor to be like, no, we're doing it this way. Yeah. And so there's benefits to both ways. That but sounds like China and the US with a conductor and without a conductor. I mean, they definitely we're, have a conductor. We're doing it this way, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, but I think we have it the same thing. Where there's a reason you have a president and you don't just have Congress. Yeah, I think yeah. part of it, right. I think one of the reasons you do that is because of that processing power is you do need... That's a good point. It, so and then the same thing with juries, like is 12 people the right number? Like if you put 18 people on the jury, you might be better off in terms of it's more going to reflect the opinion of America at large. The more people you add, just the more reflective it will be of the population. But at a certain point, nothing will get done. You'll never get a jury that agrees on anything if you have a thousand people on the jury. That's interesting, yeah. So I think that's the issue, is right now there, the speed is rapidly increasing. We, the amount of technology that's coming out is rapidly increasing, but the number of people is increasing, and so the processing time is going down. Yeah, billions of people in just the last couple yeah, of decades. Yeah, try to get a billion people to agree on something. something. It will take forever. Yeah. So there is this danger of like not having agreement on everything, yeah. or, or making it very difficult for people to just agree, because there's more people yeah, and more yeah. opinions. Yeah. And so we don't want to ever get to a point where like, you, you know, there's that danger of one guy making a decision or one girl making a decision that like has a very negative effect on a lot of people and, it, and he gets to do it because he's made the decision and done it before anybody else can be like, wait, what? I'm sorry. It sounds like some of the algorithms for the two billion people that use YouTube and Facebook, that's what this sounds like when, when just, a handful, making decisions. Uh, just a handful of people are in charge of two billion human animals' perception on social platforms. Well, that's a whole other thing is that now the tools, it used to be that you could, uh, a small group of people couldn't own a tool that had that much kind of reach. Like, so there are, we now have tools that will reach a billion people instantly or, or eight, I mean, yeah. seven billion people instantly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, that kind of power is something no human has had before. <laughs> like that's, that you had, you had a newspaper baron, but how many people did the newspaper baron, how many eyeballs did he really control? Yeah. And he was considered very powerful. So yeah. I think, yeah, there's a lot of danger in that and I, there is no, I don't know, there's, there's no easy or pat answer for how do you yeah. regulate and how do you control and make sure that nobody gets hurt. Yeah, it's going to be tough for us to figure out how to prosper collectively, but it's um, the most important thing we can figure out is how to love each other and move forward together cohesively as a single earth tribe. Well, I th that's, that's like such a perfect thing because like my thesis in college was on race related humor and its effect on prejudice. And so was, I did a lot of research on prejudice, racism, all that kind of thing. And the main factor in anything, misogyny, homophobia, it's in-group versus out-group. Yeah. So what you define as your in-group yep, yep. is your group, yes, and then yes. you kind of, the out-group is, is, is outside of you. And so if they get hurt, it doesn't matter in a way. Like you, you, it's how we're tribally built. Yeah, yeah. And if we define the in-group as humanity, exactly. it's a lot better. People are a lot better to each other because yes. we're all the in-group. Exactly.
And there's this whole practice of learning how to really do a really good job at getting behind someone else's eyes and seeing how they've lived a life uh, and absorbed stimuli through their life, through their 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, however old they are, and then be able to really gain that sense of, oh, this is how you got the belief systems that you've had yeah. and really carry that on to other people. And fundamental attribution error, like not falling victim to FAE, like realizing that, I mean, fundamental attribution error, I'm sure you're familiar, but like the idea of that, for anybody who wasn't Teachers, a, yeah. a nerdy psych major like I was. Um, <laughs> basically, the idea is the biggest error we make, according to psychologists, that's why it's the fundamental attribution error, is that we tend to attribute behavior to internal things. So the guy was mean to me because he's an asshole. Can we say, can I say that word? Of course, okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but maybe that guy's mean to me because he had a really, really shitty day and he's actually the nicest person in the world, but you caught him on the one bad day. Where something tr terrible's going on with this family or health. Yeah, something or, awful. Yeah, and so that, yeah. like, anybody would be in a bad mood. And so yeah. instead of saying he's a, he's a bad person because he's in a bad mood, maybe he's a great person. And once you recognize what FAE is, yeah. it really makes you, I think, a better person. I have to sometimes step back. I, I, I totally. screw it up all the time. But it's like realizing if somebody does something that it's not maybe not who they are, it's the environment or the, 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 some, the something external. Yeah. And that also helps you relate more to a person. You're like, maybe that person isn't, doesn't mean to be mean to me. He's actually a really nice person, but he just has circumstances around him that are causing him to be mean in this moment. Yep, yep. That's always a slow down and really cognize and think instead of immediately react. And that's a whole process of meditation as well that can help us with that. Um, I, I'm glad you brought up um, fundamental attribution errors. And actually, actually this all kind of ties, okay, let's transition now. You did psych, you did psych at Harvard, but besides that, you also started the Harvard Stand-Up Comedians. The, it was a Harvard, it was originally the Harvard Stand-Up Comic Society, so it was Harvard Sucks was the acronym. Stand-Up Comic Society. Yeah, so, so, so we submit the paperwork. Harvard Sucks, as a to, joke, yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So I submit the paperwork, but I'm like, I'm not, if I write, Harvard sucks on the application, they're immediately gonna be like, no, no. you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, like, I'm gonna painfully write out that Harvard acronym. Stand Up Comics Society. I'm never gonna use the acronym at any point in the paperwork. I'm just gonna write it out every time. So I send in the paperwork and you know, you wait, you get an email from the dean's office. We need to see you about the paperwork. And I'm like, damn it, they figured it yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's Harvard, they shit, they're yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah. So I go in and they go, yeah, it's the name. And I go, damn it. They go, you're actually an undergrad organization, so it should be the Harvard College Stand-Up Comic Society. Do you mind changing it? We'll approve it right away. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. they did not see this. See this yeah. So we became Harvard College Sucks, Sucks. which is just as funny. funny. Yeah, yeah. And then like years later, I job. ran into somebody in the dean's <laughs> office who was like, uh, we obviously when you were a student, we couldn't tell you this, but God damn, that was like the funniest prank somebody's ever pulled off on us. We're like, you totally got us. We did not see it. <laughs> the only reason they knew we were, it was Harvard College Sucks was after the organization had been around for a few months, we applied to the trademark office because if you want to print up a sweatshirt that has Harvard yeah. on it, you got to get approval because yeah. it's their logo and their brand. So you just send in a request like, hey, I'm going to make t-shirts. They're going to say Harvard. It's for our group on campus. <laughs> so we, we send in the, the design and it says like Harvard sucks on it, like Harvard College sucks on it. And uh, they were like, oh, God damn it. No, we get That's it. when I got the angry email where they were like, God, we can't take their approval back, but you, you got us. <laughs> so yeah, that, it, was a, it, was a fun, it was a fun time. And so the... First, so for, there's a couple things that I want to get to. As you know, you're really going hard because Harvard is tough to get into, and you start surrounding yourself with really intelligent, diverse people from around the world. Yeah. There, um, so there's like a really, there's like a salient moment in life for you right there where you're like, wow, I went from being really, really smart in high school to being one of so many smart people. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about that moment. I mean, it's great. Like you feel. I mean, obviously you. It, it, you, 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 it's, we're talking about tribes, like you walk into Harvard and everybody, like all of a sudden you're like, oh, like I can say that big word and not have to explain it to anybody else. I know it sounds like horrible, but like, there's that sense of, okay, like we're all on the level. And not that everybody at Harvard is smart, they're yeah. definitely not, there are legacies, but um, <laughs> there, there, are, there are athletes. Um, no, <laughs> almost everybody there is very smart. Um, but it's not to say also that like people who don't get in aren't smart. Like, that's the w crazy thing about Harvard is there is so much luck because I think I think the statistics that I heard, I mean, it's probably changed a lot, but 20,000 people apply, it's probably a lot more now, but 20,000 people applied I think when I applied, and like 16,000 of them would be considered academically eligible. So like the yeah. vast majority are considered smart enough to do the coursework and do well at Harvard. Yeah, damn. 16 out of 20,000. 
Yeah. So then how do you, from that 16,000, how do you find the 1,500 yeah, yeah. that 1500, is actually going to yeah. get in? So there, yeah. there, there's all these other factors of like, oh, are you really good at this thing? You know, I always, yeah, correct. They always say being, um, oh, what was it? Being, uh, you could be well-rounded, that's one thing. But there's, the, there's some, I've read the phrasing, there's like an admissions officer described it where it's like being really well unrounded, where it's like you're so good at this one thing that like we should put you in the class because you're the best figure skater in the world sure, or you're sure. the best Biotech. violinist or yeah. the best, yeah. yeah. You invented this thing that they use in knee replacement surgery, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. So finding those people are really good for the class too. And I, I always felt like my whole job was to discover what everybody's superpower was because yep. everybody had, had a, a thing. Superpower, yeah. You'd be like, you'd be talking to somebody. I remember I was trying to ask a girl on a date. I was like, oh, we should go ice skating. I'm a terrible ice skater. But I was like, I'd done it a couple of times. Like, oh, I can show you some tricks that I picked up. <laughs> and she was like an Olympic level figure skater. <laughs> I had no idea. And she was so kind. She was just like, I mean, like, I've done it before. And I'm like, oh, really? Where have you done it? And she was like, I mean, like, at the Olympics. And I'm like, oh, shit. shit. Like, <laughs> God damn it. You should yeah. be teaching me, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. fall on my face. So like everybody has that. Everybody That's has the thing. That's a cool environment thing. to be in. Yeah. yeah. Now, now you attribute a lot of your interest initially in comedy to your grandfather. So tell us about the comedy and the magic um, interest when you were young and how that went in through Harvard into now. Yeah. I mean, I I've been very lucky. I I've uh, I only had three grandparents. My grandfather passed away before I was born, so my name is Harrison, which is based on Harold. So I'm named after the one grandfather that didn't make it. Um, but. Uh, yeah, my paternal grandfather, Holocaust survivor, went to, was in Auschwitz, um, lost his whole family, um, but had a really great sense of humor. By the time I met him, in, when he was in America, having lived in America, um, you know, it, it was, and there was that remarkable contrast between somebody who's seen literally the worst possible thing you could see and being really funny. And I think that was part of what, Whoa. how you get through that. Yeah. And that's a powerful lesson as a totally. child to realize like that's what humor can do is allow you to get through those kind of things. And to keep your sanity, like how do you keep your, like it's a, it's a, if you went insane because of what you saw, no one would, everyone would understand. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't, he was, he had a sense of humor and he was, he was incredible. Yeah. Uh, and then the other side, my, pater my maternal grandmother, we used to like drive around in her Vava listening to 2000 year old man on like cassette tape. And so she really introduced me to like all those comedians, the Mel Brooks and we, watching It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And really that also is getting that part of the humor and the structure and the craft of it. Yep. So I really, you know, and then obviously my parents are just very funny and awesome and they they have incredible senses of humor. So that just, yeah, that's yeah. how you make a comedian. <laughs> so they should have known that you were gonna pursue. It's all their fault, yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> you did this. <laughs> Um, and then, so did the stand-up then start in college then? Was that yes. the first year? So I was a kid magician. Uh, I'm still a magician. I love magic so much. Um, I was five years old. I started doing magic tricks. Um, I always loved performing. And I would do tricks, you know, I, was at, I would just perform at the drop of a hat. Um, and that hat would have a rabbit. Um, no. Um, but I, I'm, I, this is the problem with drinking coffee is I'm just like, I'm gonna end up going faster. And th we're talking about You're that like- You're hockey sticking right now. I'm hockey sticking right now is exactly what's happening. You're gonna be like, wow, his words are, are just, yeah. So fast. So fast. Um, but yeah, I did magic my whole life. Went to magic camp uh, where I'm still a counselor and I love it. Tennis magic camp. Go, if your kid's interested in magic, send them. It's life changing. Um, but then I got to college and I had a fraternity brother who was like, yeah, I'm doing this stand up comedy show. And they only did it once a year. And the reason I started my group actually was because I wanted there to be sort of a home for stand-up constantly, not just one show a year. Um, but he was like, come do it, do magic. You're funny when you do magic, come to our show. And I was like, well, why don't I try stand-up? And I did it and sort of, I was addicted. I, as soon as I got on stage and started, re I was like, this is the art form. This yeah. is this is the thing. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's most comedians, is it's a drug. Yeah. And as soon as you get that first <laughs> hit, you're like, I, you become addicted. Like stage, I feel like people who book comedy clubs often feel like, drug dealers because yeah, yeah. you have all these comics who are like trying to scratch the itch like can you get me on can you get me on can you get me on and definitely like that's probably the way they have to think about it is that they have access to this very yeah, like yeah. sought after drug well there's there's i, I kind of like to compare someone taking the stage as a comedian and making hundreds of people laugh at the same time i like to compare that 
to when someone fills like a sports stadium or for a music event or something like that and there's you know 10,000 30,000 people all just in tune with the artist or the comedian or the performer that's happening and you know that's one of the reasons why we want to take these intellectual discourses and debates and meditations and comedies and bring them to the big sports stadium stages because we love the idea of the thousands of people all at the same time having that feeling all together there's an energy for yeah. sure i hosted the ball drop in times square on new year's eve yeah. and so i got to talk in front of a million people at once literally i'm on the stage holding a microphone and i'm being beamed to a million people all over times square in new york and there's just this energy that literally just hits you in the chest because all just all eyes are aimed at one point yes and it's yes. it's intense it's crazy totally and you just you feel it you're you're it, it's just, it's almost indescribable. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is the best hit I've ever gotten. No, I'll ever reach it. Yeah. I'm going to perform for a million people every day. You'd run out of people very quickly. If you did million million people sets, it would be, you'd do like seven shows and you'd be like, done. Yeah. Um, that may, as may, that may very well be a big part of the future of performance uh, is doing it for that many people. I'm like, kind of like the America's Got Talent. This is a good segue yeah. a little bit. Although I don't know, I mean, I think 20 million people on a TV show is fine, like, but at a certain size, I think your com because comedy does have to be specific. There's always specificity, and so performing for the whole world, your comedy would have to be broader than if you're performing for one country Absolutely. or performing for one state. That's a great or, point. Yeah. So there is a broadening which would reduce art. If you try to perform something that makes the whole world happy, yeah, it's not going to be harder. it's, it's going to be a very different art. But it's also I think um, it might be watered down or so broad as to lose its sort of uniqueness to a degree but then there's also that it's so broad that you can make it so that all of the humor is humor that earth can relate to with you can maybe talk about things like how complex the hockey sticking is and how we need to work together in, in fun ways like something crazy like the genetically engineered children walking around and like right a, but I'm, I'm speaking like culturally like I, I just did a tour in Kazakhstan yeah. and you have to rewrite your Whoa. whole set not only was I being translated into Russian, so that's a, a language barrier thing that you I had to work with this translator who was incredible. We had to work really hard to figure out how do you translate these jokes. But then even if he translated me exactly word for word, there's so much cultural difference. That's right. And that's so like point. even saying a joke where you're like, I'm gonna go to the supermarket, if you're performing for the whole world, that doesn't track for everybody. Some people are like, what's a supermarket? Yeah, yeah. Or, or the it's word that you use. store in their language, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it could be that, or even the concept. Like, the yeah. way I, you know, like the way we treat women and our, we, you know, they're equals, as There's they should be. There's probably no Walmarts in Laos. But there are certain countries where like, they're behind culturally in terms of like, women's rights, uh, gay rights, civil rights. Yeah, that's true. So if you yeah, act yeah. like, it's an if you take the assumption, obviously women and men are equal. Yeah which I would hope would eventually be the world's thing. Some countries don't yeah. necessarily believe that right now. So they wouldn't get that joke. Yeah. So like that's that, you know. Or people of all, yeah, skin color or religion or um, whatever. Um, if you do a joke where like my wife was driving, there's some countries where they're like, what do you mean a woman's driving? Like. There's that, yeah. You know, yeah. That, there's, there's that, that thing. Yeah. Like, so at a certain point you get so high level that you lose the ability to make jokes. There's like high concepts of like, do we all see red? And then you go, shit, there's colorblind people. Like. There's always one group yeah, yeah. that you might, so it's See, too many groups. See, but that and, yeah. opens people up also to uh, people saying, oh, well, why is it okay for women to drive there? Maybe that's something that we should adapt and change to. So that's also interesting. It could be broadening people's perspectives through jokes like that. Um, okay, so that's a really cool uh, part of this like global picture of comedy. Now, w now, what is it like, you know, working your way up to um, doing Last Comic Standing and Conan and America's Got Talent? And what was that process like? And then what is it like being there, and doing yeah, this? Yeah, it's exciting. There's a lot of pressure. Like America's Got Talent, you know the numbers going in that it's I think it's 20 million people are watching an episode. So you go from 200 people to 20 million people, and you also realize that like let's say the average audience size that I'm getting up to live, you know, when I'm in a comedy club, 200 people. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll do, I'll do theaters with thousands of people, but even if I did a thousand people a night, in the number of nights I would need to do to hit 20 million. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm doing that in one set. So there's yes. this pressure of like, I'm gonna perform for more people in this moment than I will in years of touring, um, even decades of touring. You, you, you don't wanna think about that too much because then you'll psych yourself out. But that's something in the back of your head. So there's a, there's a pressure to that. Um, 
but then like there's there's a saying like over prepare and then go with the flow and that's that's sort of my approach to any tv thing is be way over prepared do the set a million times run around like before conan um i got the call I, I, or is it, e- it was an email um but i got an email on i want to say thursday or, or wednesday something like that it was like thursday or friday they're like we we're, we're ready because basically they approve your set and then it's about waiting for a slot in an episode to give you. So you get the email like Friday, Thursday, Friday, you're getting Tuesday. We're gonna fly you out Monday and you're gonna be on the show Tuesday. So you got a lot of pre- preparation. So you're like, oh yeah. shit, I yeah. have four days yeah. between now and Conan. Yeah. Not that I haven't, the, the only way to get to that point in the set is you've sent them a video, it's a set you've done a million times already. So you've yeah. done the hours already. Totally. But that's but that moment where you're like, okay, Conan's in four days. I just called every favor I could. I was like, I want to go on stage and run the five minute set that I'm doing for Conan. Yep. And I did 22 shows, I think, in like three days. Perfect. And then boom. So yep. I, I really ran that thing like a marathon runner. That's how a professional does it. This is, that's yeah. really well done, yeah. And Seinfeld used to literally jog, so he felt like, a, like an athlete, like he would run around, like I'm yeah. doing my set over and over again. Exactly, yeah. And so that's the over prepare part. And then the go with the flow is, you can prepare as much as you want, but if you're a robot, it, you're not going to deliver the way you want. Totally. You're not supposed to be over preparing so that you can do it without thinking. Because right. as soon as you remove the thinking component, you're dead. So like even with the set on Conan, one of the first things I did was a riff because they like stood up immediately as soon as I walked out. And I was like, I haven't done anything yet. You guys can sit down. <laughs> and that's obviously not something you prepare. You don't know that's going to happen. Totally, totally. But if I wasn't in the moment, then I wouldn't be able to do that. So yeah. the, the over prepare, go with the flow. Is sort of my like mantra for any of that TV thing. It was like yeah, you're yeah. gonna do the over prepare and that's good, but then you need to give yourself the freedom to break from the thing that you've been rehearsing a million times. Yep, yep. Those are really good pieces of advice, and I like how your drive is so is so evident. There is that you know you work your ass off to get the opportunity, and then when you get it, you go and you hustle around 22 shows prior, you know, to yeah. go through the practice, and then you still remain a presence, a really humane presence when you walk in through the door to be able to um, to be there with the audience and engage with them in a friendly way. Um, it seems kind of crazy to be doing 600 plus shows. Not if you're an addict. Uh, Not if you're an addict. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, seems how, it seems weird how often you want to do heroin. Like, <laughs> so this is like two to three sometimes a night. Oh, like absolutely. Like a five o'clock, seven and nine, or seven, nine, eleven. It's usually way later. It's usually yeah. like your first show's around seven or eight. Comedy before seven or eight can be weird. <laughs> Comedy's better in the darkness. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can go till four o'clock in the morning sometimes, just running sets. And I think the record, I think I did 10 shows in a day was like my record for most shows in one 24 hour period. That's badass. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, now, now, how often are you writing new material for the different sets? Always. 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 So, always. But so, sometimes, like, yeah. I always say you have to change something about every set. So every set, you have to do at least one thing different. Otherwise, you're not taking in fresh data. And granted, you can do the that's same right. set to different audiences, and that's going to be different. Be like, ooh, does it work in this room and yeah, this yeah. environment? But I'm always trying to change, even tweaking one word or one pause, changing where the pause is. So at least I'm trying something new because if I don't, then the set doesn't ever get better. Yeah. Um, so I'm always changing a little bit, but sometimes it's massive. Sometimes I'm gonna walk out and I've never done this bit before. And you're gonna sandwich it between bits you know work so you have cushion. But that's yeah. the excitement. Like we, as comics we always talk about, like the day a new bit works is one of the most exciting yeah. days because you have a new toy. It really new feels toy. like a kid yeah. and you got a new toy for Hanukkah or Christmas. And you're like, I have this new thing to play with. Yeah. Because you can still play with the old toys, but you played with them for a year, and you're like you're pretty much aware of how this toy works. Yeah. But then you get this fresh new toy, and then that's the addiction, right? Is that the, you have this fresh toy, so you want to play with it all the time, and then eventually you've kind of overplayed with it. That's you right. You play with it a lot, and you're like, okay, I'm ready for the next toy. Toy. That's a good way to put the specific jokes that you're writing is that you go and you land the first time and you're like yes awesome and then you go tinker with it and put it into your different sets and then you you know get old you get sick of the toy but you already have new material that you've been testing and writing um that's good that's good it's a good way to put it um okay so i think this is really important because i think a lot of young people don't necessarily even know that comedy is a it's humor is really important in our world yeah it's so crucial. Um, well, I guess, and the lessons yeah, of humor. Like I've lectured um, on how you, how you use comedy in a non-comedy context. That doesn't mean you have to be funny, but like the less 
comedians are all about giving you as much information as possible in as tiny space as possible. It's about compressing yeah. yes. sort of a lot of ideas into a tiny space. It's like a the good way, compression algorithm. Yeah, and yeah. it's like the way poetry works too. Like you, the same such example. a tiny space with all of this yes. stuff in it. Yes. And so like that's a really good way to communicate. Yeah. Uh, and humor, like being aware of yourself and how you're being perceived and being honest and authentic. That's the other thing that comedians are is yeah. we'll tell you how we feel. And yeah. sometimes if you're uncomfortable at a meeting or you're something's happening that's strange, instead of ignoring it, just say it. And like the relief that goes through the room yeah, when yeah. you're like, yeah, isn't this crazy? <laughs> They're like, oh my God, it was crazy. Okay, let's fix it. Why hold that back? So that kind of honesty and authenticity is a lesson. Even if you don't need to be funny per se, you can still learn that from a comedian. I love that. The It's kind of blunt, it's very like blunt, honest about the moment instead of holding things back and releasing feelings, the compression that you're talking about, this is all, this is all super important. Um, how does one figure out when to um, enter humor into <laughs> because then there's also people that are really serious and like, like to be really serious and so if you're trying to you know say like oh this is really crazy isn't it we're all just yeah there's a time and a place for humor for sure like if you're if something very if you're at a funeral like the odds of you making a, a killer joke <laughs> are, are lower like be appropriate with who you're with um, but yeah I feel like there's definitely people could use more humor yeah. And like with emails, like obviously be careful. You don't want to email the CEO of your company and like try a joke that might offend them. That's a <laughs> bad plan. But like sometimes being a little funny is, is a good thing. Um, yeah. I think we, the, world, the world on whole needs more humor than less for sure. Yes, though. yes, yes. Now, how does one, think, as we, we'll get to kids in a moment, how does one get to knowing how to be properly, um, you know, there's, there's a big uprising of political correctness happening and a big uprising of people being offended by things. And there's there's a certain amount of ethics that are evolving yeah. Although finally. I will say, because people keep saying that there's like, people are getting more offended. I don't necessarily know if that's true. Okay. I think the tools for people who are offended to be loud Louder. and make it known yeah. are definitely, like pre-Twitter, I think, I think people were just as, I think people were always as offended. When you talk about like, my heroes from older generations, like your Richard Pryor, your George Carlin, mm -hmm. your Smother Brothers, like mm -hmm. those guys got a ton of complaints when they were on television, but they were letters that were mailed to the TV networks. And so you never saw them unless you were the TV network and then they could choose whether or not they responded to them. They could be like, what do you mean we got a ton of letters? And then like kick the door closed of the closet yeah, that's yeah, overflowing yeah, with letters. letters. We didn't get any complaints. complaints yeah. Or they can be like, wow, we got complaints. We got to cancel this show. So I don't know if the outrage and offense is more but now a random person can tweet something and a million people can see it. So that one, one person who was outraged can amplify his message. Interesting though. So I, I don't know if people yeah, are more offended. I just think people are more aware when people are offended. Yeah, there's a amplification with exponential technology yeah. that's happened. That's interesting. And then there, then there becomes a really interesting dilemma as a comedian, which is are, when you're responding to offense, making sure that you're not responding to one person amplified a million times as opposed to a million people being offended and, and that being one message being sent. So it's figuring out which one it is. Because you don't want, if only one person is offended out of a million, yeah. you're probably doing fine. Yeah, yeah. But if that person is as, allowed, as loud as a million, that message has the same volume as a million people being offended at volume one. Yeah. I think one of the goals in many ways of comedy is to help people evolve their ethics, ones that may not be caught up yet in the equality of opportunity between men, women, people of all different skin colors and religions and places around the world. So this comedy's role is to help people evolve towards that unity, towards that Yeah, um, there's studies from I, like the 50s and 60s, because in doing my thesis, I read anything. If, you, if humor was the key word in your psychological article, I, I read it. Um, and there's all these studies where they just tell you statements, so people read very serious essays trying to persuade you about you know, why misogyny is wrong. And then there would be a joke that illustrates why misogyny is wrong. And even though the joke is shorter and it doesn't have any data the way a scientific or serious article would, jokes are on whole far more persuasive at changing attitude than a serious comment. And that's a very powerful tool. Like it, it, the way I, I looked at it was it's sort of like a, like a, 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 a sneak attack. 
Like you're, by the time your brain realizes that information has been injected into your brain, it's too late. Because you're like, oh, it's just, it's just a joke. I'll listen to the joke. And then you're like, oh, no, he hid this thought in it. <laughs> As opposed to when you just hear a thought, you can immediately be like, do I like this thought or not? And so you want to use the tool for good. It can also be yes. used for bad. Totally. There are racist jokes. Totally, yeah. Punching that, up versus down, yeah. 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 I mean, so you, it's a, it's a, any power can be used for good or bad. That's right. Yeah, Knowing this, about physics can be used to build a bomb. Yeah. But it can also help people. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing. Jokes are a more persuasive thing than a statement. Use your power for good. That's a good point. I like that, Harrison. Okay, um, <clears throat> teach us about why do we see so few examples of kids being able to enter comedy? Why is it so difficult for this process? Like for kids, like even children? It seems, yeah. But children, I mean, like children in the sense that when we're young in high school, no one's coming in and saying, "Why don't you practice speaking in front of people and telling jokes?" Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and building up a sense of stage presence, building up a, getting through that barrier of fear, also practicing humor, practicing it amongst your friends. See, I don't think there's enough of that in the in the early years of children. And then there's well, the they're, same thing of like. I, if you ask a five-year-old to write a play, it's gonna be, it could be very fun to watch, but it's not gonna be, it's... Yeah, but 14 to 18-year-olds have evolved much more than yeah, five, and so yeah. they're much more able to come up with material. I don't know if the, even if the 14-year-old is now more advanced, I don't know if they're, there's a, a self-awareness that's required from comedy. Sure, that comes in like maybe that, the early 20s yeah. or whatnot, yeah. Not to say that I haven't seen some very young comics who are very good. I have good. too, yeah. But also, just pragmatically, sure. the way we experience comedy right now is in comedy clubs and at bars. It's yeah. a lot of alcohol and a lot of adults. So I think there is just a pragmatic thing where comedy sure. is consumed by adults in adult environments. Whereas, like, it's the same thing with a certain kind of, you can see a musical that's geared for kids and then there's adult musicals. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is room for it, but I do think there is just pragmatically because comedy is consumed in these adult environments, it's harder for a kid to, because they're physically, they're, Legal, legally not allowed to enter some of these environments. Yeah, yeah, and then there maybe needs to be then environments for younger people below 21, up maybe 15 to 21 or whatnot, for them to be able to go and test their footing. Um, that could be quite interesting. <clears throat> okay, that's a, that's. And a then it's point. also the audience, right? So if I'm a stand-up comic who's 14, um, you, it's a very different set if I'm a 14-year-old performing for adults versus 14 year old performing for other 14 year olds. That's right. And that will be really interesting that's to see. Right. That's right. Is to have teenagers design stand-up comedy that's really to be consumed by teenagers. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot to poke fun at in the social media age of how we use 100%. the devices and yeah, how we're addicted to them. And if they can start poking fun at that and getting people to be like, okay, we are ridiculous right yeah. now. Yeah, that could it's help a great a idea. The, the, yeah. That person would have to literally invent a market. Yeah. Because they can't just go to the comedy club because that's where adults are showing up. So they All have right. to figure out. Boom, we got this. Let's have a 3 p.m. show where teenagers are allowed. Like it'll be, we, it'll be we, cool. we got this. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the after school. Tween comedy. Yeah, tween comedy. We got the after school. Let's make this market happen. It's like 16 to 20 year old market. Um, okay, a um, couple. Okay, couple last thoughts on the way out. Um, I would love to see that. Like where a 14 year old is like, isn't so, aren't, isn't having a substitute teacher amazing? <laughs> Like, they would Even kill, that like, joke so good, yeah. It's like th that they're... When they sit there struggling yeah. trying to pronounce the name of foreign kids in the classroom's names and they're like, Zakimine. Is that right? <laughs> it's like, why do they even try? Just be like, hi, I, this name is spelled this way. It's, I, it's not for me to butcher it. Why don't you just tell me how to pronounce it and I will nail it. There you go. Instead yeah. of making this weird attempt where they're just like, uh, is there a huh in it? And you're like, what? <laughs> See, this is what I'm saying. This is good stuff. Or like how just how addicted we are to messaging each other in the classroom and yeah. talking about things. Um, and it would be a good window. I don't know if adults who are like in their 30s would find that. I think really good 14-year-old comedy for 14-year-olds should be unfunny to 30-year-olds. We should be like, what? You're complaining about that? Because yeah, yeah. our problems are so much bigger in a way. Yeah, we're like, yeah, you're yeah. worried about homework and, and we're worried like about the world, world falling apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah and not to say like, that these, we have all these teenage activists who are incredible. That's right. But their their day-to-day -day is is a lot different than our day-to-day. -day. So that's right. That, yeah. And that's, again, to bring a full circle of like, performing for the world versus performing for a specific audience. You can do a lot more when you know your specific audience. So if a 14-year-old is performing for a 14-year-old, there's some amazing things. And then finding out what's really laughing, because when everyone's laughing, that's them saying, oh, I feel this way, or oh, I, I get it. If you have a room of 1,000 14-year-olds laughing at a problem, 
and I'm an adult and I hear that, I'm like, this is a problem I can fix and make their lives better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just all the, all the students now that have laptops in the classrooms, LOL, are you actually doing homework right now? No. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm such a hand writer, and that's a dinosaur thing now. It's crazy. Um, okay, a couple, yeah, the couple quick questions on the way out. Um, <clears throat> okay, first question is, what would you say is a core driving principle of yours? Ooh, that's, that's hard. Um, I mean, I, I, the, I guess the good example is uh, Taylor Swift. Um, I did warm up comedy for Katie Couric's talk show. So there, there's a lot of celebrities coming through and Taylor Swift said something that was really important. It was there's a difference between walking on stage and saying, here I am, like you're welcome. Oh yeah. And walking on stage and saying, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, totally, yeah. And that's, oh, my drive is always that ladder of like, I'm in, I'm in service of the audience. That's the right. audience is not here to see me per se, I'm there to make you happy. Happy, yeah. I'm, to, I'm doing all this work and making all these sacrifices so that you can have a fun night out. Yep. And you can enjoy yourself and you can, maybe you learn or maybe it changes how you think, but I'm doing that for you. Yep. And so that's the core driver is making sure at all points that it's not an exercise and like, I want you to see how good I am. That's not what this is about. It's, yep. I'm trying to get good enough so that you can have this really amazing moment. It's all about that, aiming the arrow from the stage out to the audience. Exactly. Yeah. I'm aiming this. It's not about what the, what the audience is doing coming towards me. That's right. That's well, that, that, that may be oversimplified because I'm have the la totally. i using the laughter and all that stuff to do stuff. Yep, but it's yep. about me giving you something as opposed to you giving me something. Yes, yes. Very beautifully said. I, I like that core driving principle. We're always, we find a lot of our meaning in life by giving to From Taylor others. Swift. Yes, that's Yeah, it. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we come out with gratitude for this experience. You know, the gratitude to be sitting down with you, the gratitude for the viewers that are watching this. Um, and when we carry that presence, it really helps us melt more into our humanity um, and less so into our ego. And gratitude practice. Like I took a class in college called Positive Psychology and that was writing a gratitude journal or telling people you appreciate them. Like, I'm so grateful. I wrote a letter to my grandmother for her 80th birthday. Yeah. She ended up passing away before her 81st. I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. But I wrote her a letter, it was just a gratitude letter. It was yeah. just, let me tell you why you're so special to me. Yeah. And it was this letter that I gave just to her in an envelope, like, this is for you, read it later. And of course she showed it to everybody and framed it because she's a Jewish grandmother. <laughs> but the goal was it was supposed to be a private thing. But of course she's like, look at this. Look at this. He loves me. Hey, um, and she knew, she, she always knew how grateful I was. I don't think I ever, she never not, didn't know that. But that letter meant so much to her. That's as right. a result, it meant so much to me. That's right. And when she did pass, it made it slightly easier to know that she at least knew how much she changed my life. And so like that gratitude practice is very, very important. Yeah. That's a really crucial lesson. There's an pass. assignment. Just that, text somebody right. or write a letter to that's somebody right. that maybe doesn't know how grateful you are. That's right. We've and we've had um, Andy on our show before, where we've actually talked about. Um, he actually has a site where people can go and write this letter to people um, quite easily about what they're grateful for about them. And my whole point being is this is such a great exercise with your relatives, with your older relatives. Yeah. Express the gratitude that they worked hard to bring you into the world for. Um, yeah. And shout out while we're talking about gratitude. There's Rabbi Brian, who is a counselor at Magic Camp. Um, he's still a very good friend of mine. Um, he's a, an amazing person. And he puts out a newsletter. He has this thing called Religion Outside of the Box. And it's all about sort of the, the, it's your, whatever your spiritual understanding is, spiritualism as a practice, regardless of what religion you are. He's a rabbi, but it doesn't matter if you're not Jewish. And so like that kind of gratitude practice, yeah. like he's such a, uh, he's always about all that stuff. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, in terms of paying it forward and showing gratitude, I'm grateful to him. And I think he, you guys should check him out. Yep. I completely no. un, no. <laughs> completely un, uh, too much coffee. We are we are plugging our <laughs> gratitude for people We're, that have me, me, mental health. That have taught me us. about gratitude. So yes. there you go. Now, okay. Next question is: If you could rebuild civilization from scratch, how would you design it? Ooh, um, if I could build it from scratch, um, it's funny because you end up in a Twilight Zone scenario where like, I'm just gonna make everybody look identical so that none of those things are an issue. But then they would just fixate on like the tiniest microscopic thing like, oh, this guy's hair goes this way and this guy's hair goes that way. Like, so there, you can't fix any of the problems. So you assume that kind of our brains are built the way they are 
Um, I don't even if like even if you like remove, you make sure nobody ever goes hungry. Then there's just more and more people, and eventually the world runs out of resources. It's so, like how do you design a system? I mean, I guess I, the, the only thing, the most basic thing would be the, what we're talking about with making sure everybody who's born recognizes that they're all part of the in-group. Okay. That this idea of having these arbitrary divisions is almost never, if ever, the right solution. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you need it because, you, not, not need it, but like, sometimes you need to recognize like my family is a unit and I need to take care of my family, not at the expense of other families, but you need to concentrate on your family unit and that starts to become in-groupy to a, to a degree. Yeah. Um, but you, you always, when push comes to shove, realize that we're all part of the same group. Yeah. And so if you work from that philosophy, that on a whole we have a lot more in common than different with everybody, it solves a lot of, most of the major issues that we have is about treating everybody the same, regardless of what, who they are. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good first principle of the of the design is yeah. to have everyone understand we're all on the in group of Earth, the in yeah. group of Earth. It's it's animals. a step. It's one step past do unto others as you would do unto yourself because that's almost selfish. Is like would they like if I like it then they'll like it to a degree. Mm -hmm. This is about just recognizing that everybody is is in the same group. We're all on the same team. Yeah, yeah. Team human. Team, team human. Team Earth. That should be your merch. Yeah, you yeah. say team human. Yeah, we got we got a uh, Douglas Rushkoff's a good friend, and uh, we're really excited uh, featuring him soon. He's a big advocate on team human. He's wrote a book on it. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, he we owes got, me royalties. We have a lot. We have, we have <laughs> I a take lot 10%. of cool, We have a lot of cool team human merch that's uh, with our own themes and stuff. That's all amazing. Also. Um, last two questions. That's the closest I will get to sports gear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, is is on t team human. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, last two questions. First one is. Wouldn't be simulation if we didn't ask you, are we in a simulation? Ooh, would I know if I was in a simulation? That's really the question. <laughs> um, I mean, after the Truman movie came out, there was a huge rise in people believing they were, they were Truman. Um, who, kn who knows? I think we all watched that movie and we're like, wait a second, like checking behind cabinets for cameras, like, ah. we would never know. And so I guess the point is to just be the best person you can be. Like the other, core motivator for me, and I think if I'm building the simulation, it all connects, is to leave the world a better place than when I entered it. Totally. I don't know if it's gonna be a small amount better or a large amount better, but leave it better. Yeah. Um, and I think that we're, whether we're in a simulation or not, that principle still applies. If, it's, if we're in the matrix, it's kind of more of a waste <laughs> to make the, the matrix better than um, That's your ultimate test, is to continue leveling up and making this place better and yeah. focusing on that. That's your test in the simulation. That's the test, yeah. yeah. So whether it's a simulation or not. Yeah, yeah. And we'll be able to poke and prod at the, at the code soon to figure, out, figure it out, I think. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Okay, and last question, Harrison. What's the most beautiful thing in the world? The beautiful, most beautiful thing in, a wor in the world? I mean, I'm a comedian, so it's probably make, when somebody laughs, like really laughs. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And if you can give that gift to somebody, it's, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful when people are legitimately laughing so hard. You know, there's no, there's no better compliment after a set when somebody comes up and like, I've had a really rough week or month or year. And for that, those moments you were on stage, I forgot about it and I was really happy. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, for me as a comedian, the most beautiful thing in the world is making somebody laugh. Yeah. That's why I'm a comedian. I love that. And whenever I'm laughing my ass off, rolling around on the floor, right? When I'm doing that, those moments are so precious. I just try yeah. to bottle them up there. It's so precious. And you're right, when someone comes up to you and tells you about how you positively impacted their life, that's really Incredible. profound. Yeah. So this has been really enlightening. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining so us fun. on the show and talking to us. It's been a pleasure, Harrison. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, Godspeed on all of your endeavors. Everyone, check out the links below to Harrison's work in his bio. Also, um, go and uh, go, go and go and go and push yourself out into uncomfortable circumstances and situations where you can really test yourself into the world. Find meaning through that process. Go and enter some jokes into into the world and uh, really practice. With care. With care. I'm just yeah. so nervous sometimes to be like put a joke in the middle of like their email like, to their CEO. Yeah, or exactly. Yeah, yeah. With care. With care. <laughs> with care. Yes. And. Um, 
also go and uh, so, you know support Harrison, support us, uh, join us in our efforts so we can continue doing cool things like coming out on site to great places uh, like New York to interview great leaders like Harrison. Also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your destiny into the world. We love you so much. And like, we'll don't justify it with manifest destiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> manifest your destiny. Careful with those terms. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Build. That create. was a rough period in uh, <laughs> yeah. in American history. This is mine now. Build oh. the future, everyone. We love you. Yeah, Earth as one. We love you. Team human. Team human. Much love. We'll see you soon. Peace.